Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So let us again indulge ourselves in the pleasures of linear programming. So here is the problem that we are going to study minimize C transpose x subject to A x equal to B x greater than equal to 0. I will just list down everything where C is in R n, n could be anything, n could be 2, 3, 4, 5, it does not matter. A is a m cross n matrix. and the rank of A is M, B is of course element of R M, X the decision vector naturally is in R M which I do not have to specify because you take a inner product. Now if I want to solve this problem it is very important to know what is the feasible set that is do I or can I find points of the, the following set now uh, how do I go about doing this what is the easiest way of finding a point now this thing can be done through a little trick the trick is as follows that because you know that rank of A is M that is A is of full row rank what we can do is the following we, ob we know that thus A has m linearly independent columns of course m is less than or equal to n this is quite a standard thing because the maximum number of linearly independent vectors that you can have in n space r n is n so thus m has m linearly independent columns Now, suppose by a stroke of luck or by what we call multiplication with permutation matrices, I find that the first m columns that I have of the matrix A is actually linearly independent. So, it may not be so easy to determine which vectors are linearly independent if the matrix is very large. Then there is certain trick by which we do some, we can do something, uh, but let us just assume for the time being that I can partition the matrix into B and N where B is a N M cross M matrix. So, B is a matrix whose rows as well as columns. So, these first M rows and these are n minus m rows m columns. So, the first m columns of A are linearly independent and taking those columns and the rows themselves I form a matrix B. So, I B is an m cross m matrix and you know this I have partitioned the columns. So, this m cross m matrix B is invertible because it has m linearly independent rows and m linearly independent columns. So, B is invertible. Now, because I partition the matrix into B and N, any feasible vector can be partitioned into two parts x B and x N. So, take any vector x, let us write it down as x b 
and x n. So, x b corresponds to the indices is the vector corresponding to the indices or the indices of the first m rows and the next one corresponding to the indices of the first last n minus a, m rows. So, here I have m components and here I have n minus m components and let us assume that x is in C. If x is in C, then I must have a of x is equal to b. If I have a x of equal a of x equal to b, I can write down this as b n. So, this is a partition matrix, but you know you can think of this itself as a matrix with two components and then you can go on doing whatever you want uh, in the same policy in the same way you do matrix multiplication. So, now what you have is b times x b matrix b multiplied with the vector x b and n times x n is b. So, x of b is b minus n x n. So, this would imply sorry b of x b is b minus n of x n. So, x of b using the invertibility of b it is b inverse b minus b inverse n x n. So, what do I get from here? So, x n is free. So, if I can choose whatever x n I want I can put any value to x n then I can get x b and hence I get the vector x. So, to compute a feasible x we have x n free and putting in any values to the components of x n as I did this desire whatever I want to the components of x n I get I get the vector x b. This is clear to everyone. Now, if I choose x n is equal to 0. Now, you might ask me why you have written as x b and x n will very soon come to the point just for the time being just take on these symbols and I will come to the point very soon why x b and x n. If we choose x n equal to 0 we have x of b is equal to b inverse b and then x this vector is called b is b inverse b 0. Now, if b inverse b is greater than equal to 0 it implies that x is a member of the feasible set C because it satisfies x equal to b and x greater than equal to 0. So, any feasible solution. So, if x is element of C and x is written as b inverse b 0 then x is called a basic feasible solution. And that is why this x b x b x n equal to x this is called the basic part and this is called the non basic part. 
So, when non basic components are all 0, the feasible solution that we get is called a basic feasible solution. So, this is a basic feasible solution. The most fundamental result in linear programming is that a basic feasible solution corresponds to an extreme point of the convex feasible polyhedra. So, if you take the polyhedral set which is the feasible the set C, then every extreme point of C is a basic feasible solution to the linear programming problem and every basic feasible and every extreme point is a basic feasible solution and every basic feasible solution is an extreme point. And in fact, it can be shown that any optimal solution is a basic feasible solution and hence is attained at an extreme point is itself also an extreme point. So, what we are doing in linear programming is computing the functional values over the extreme points and then trying to find which is minimum, but if there could be huge number of extreme points if your problem data is large that is there are a lot of decision variables there could be a millions and trillions of extreme points a thing which you cannot view nobody can view it is so difficult to think about it. Now, if that is the scenario then you cannot geometrically view it neither can you do enumeration of a huge number of points the function value it will simply slow down the whole process. So, the whole question is that if I know that I have a I am at an extreme point which is a BFS, but it is not a solution to the original problem. We will show under what conditions you can check that it is not a solution to the original problem. Then what we can do is by a clever way which is called a simplex method is we can move from one vertex to another vertex. So, that the functional value the func value of C transpose x actually goes down as I go to a new extreme point. So, I have to find a clever way to keep on moving from one extreme point to the other, but at the same time keep on decreasing the function value as I keep on moving over the extreme points. So, I do not cover all extreme points only cover some few of them, but I will but I reach the solution. So, it saves enormous amount of computing time, enormous amount of effort, enormous amount of mental stress and so thing so much that this process which is achieved by the simplex method in quite a simple way is as a result very very popular and is one of the most elegant algorithms in optimization theory. So, what is the idea? So, let us write down a theorem we have not written on theorems for a long time. So, we write down a theorem you need not give it a number, but mathematicians likes to state very very state of the art important result I would say not state of the art state of the art is a misnomer uh, a very important fundamental results are usually given as theorems. So, now you might ask me how do I know that there will be an extreme point of this convex set could there be a convex set which does not have an extreme point could there be a convex set which does not have an extreme point. I am asking you this question think of an example can you find a convex set which does not have an extreme point. Now, consider this feasible set. if x is an extreme point of C actually there is a major result in convex geometry which says that every convex polyhedron set has an extreme point. If x is an extreme point then 
x is a basic feasible solution whose shorthand throughout the world in any optimization book is always BFS and BFS then x is a BFS and vice versa. In other words, x is an extreme point if and only if A, the matrix A can be decomposed into the partition B and N such that such that x equal to x B x N equal to B inverse B 0, where B is an invertible matrix. So, x, so if x is an extreme point, it can be represented like this and if x can be represented like this, then x is an extreme point, where B is an invertible m cross m matrix satisfying b inverse b greater than equal to 0. So, this is what is called a BFS. So, anything or any made thing will give some slightly different more general versions of this my very different way of defining things. So, what we have is this following result which is very very fundamental found in line any linear programming uh, book. Uh, now, given any point x in the set C, you know x can be represented as any vector which has some point 0, some point non-zero. You can always represent them, maybe the number of non-zero variables non-zero components are not there, all are positive, it could be like that because there could be something internal x must be strictly greater than 0. But in general, I can always write a point with some zeros, some non-zeros. So, let me just tell you how to go about proving this very, very important result. Now, let me do the proof. Suppose A can be decomposed, I, mean, I want to show that if I have a BFS, it is actually an extreme point. A can be decomposed into B n with x equal to this whatever I have assumed in the result. Now, to show that x is an extreme point of C, Now, x is of course, if I have this, x is of course feasible. So, step 1, let us show that x is feasible. So, let us show first, because I know just this decomposition, I know that x is greater than equal to 0, all the components are greater than equal to 0, but I do not know whether it satisfies a x equal to b, which is a major thing that we have to check. So, let us first show that that x is in C. To show that let me compute A of x which is A 
because by the hypothesis A is decomposed into two parts B and N where B is an invertible matrix M cross N and X B and X N which is B inverse B and N which is B N and B inverse B 0 which would give me B B inverse B plus N into 0. So, that would be nothing, but this would be identity because this is invertible matrix B into B inverse B is identity. So, it is B. So, what I get is A x equal to B showing that x is belonging to C. So, to first show that an extreme x is an extreme point my first step is to show that x is in C and then show that x is an extreme point of C. Now, the next step we will do our proof by the method of contradiction or reductio ad absurdum as known to Greeks, but uh, many mathematicians would not really like proofs by contradiction. They would rather like straightforward proofs, straightforward or maybe con even constructive proofs, but in certain cases it is much more easier to prove by contradiction. That is whatever we want to prove, we take an hypothesis completely opposite to that, the negation of that and then we reach a contradiction that is some actually given hypothesis is contradicted because we have assumed that our original claim is wrong. So, it means if our original claim is not correct then there is a contradiction in our actual hypothesis which means if our actual hypothesis is true it implies that our original claim is also true. So, it is P implies Q, negation of Q implies negation of P. So, this logical you know structure is used in the proof by contradiction. So, let us do the same thing. So, we will prove by contradiction. So, let x be not an extreme point, not a good English here any does not matter. If you understand what I am trying to say it is fine. Okay. Now, what? Now, which means that there must be two distinct points in A, C. So, when I take a convex combination of them with lambda between 0 and 1, then x is one of those points. So, there exists x 1 not equal to x 2, x 1 x 2 in C and lambda in 0 1 such that okay so x is represented as b inverse b0 so b inverse b consists of few vec few vectors few rows and columns so i am writing corresponding to the xb part i am dividing x1 into x 1 1 and x 1 2 and I am breaking up x 2 into x 2 1 x 2 2. You could as well as write x 1 b x 1 n x 2 b x 2 n does not matter. What I would have is that this has the same number of components as x b, this has the same number of components as x n, this has the same number of components as x b and this has the same number of components as x n. Now, what would immediately happen is that I will equate with these vectors components here, I will equate the components of these two vectors. Now, because this part in the non basic part everything is 0, so here just by convex combination because x 1 2 is greater than equal to 0, x 2 2 is also greater than equal to 0, it would imply 
which I will leave as homework for the details. Now, let us see what does it mean. It means the following. So, some part is 0. Now, I have a of because x 1 is feasible, I have a of x 1 is equal to b, which would imply again by the partition b x 1 1 plus n x 1 2 is equal to b, but x 1 2 is 0 from here from the above line and this would imply x 1 1 is equal to b inverse b. The same goes for x 2 because that being an element of c and because it is already greater than or equal to 0 it also has to satisfy it is greater than or equal to 0 and also has to satisfy x 2 is equal to b. So, this would imply b x 2 1 plus n x 2 2 is equal to b, where again from the previous line we have x 2 to equal to 0 implying that x 2 1 is equal to b inverse b. So, that would simply imply that x is equal to x 1 is equal to x 2. So, it contradicts that x 1 contradicts that and hence it is an extreme point. So, this implies that x is an extreme point. The other part the reverse is slightly tricky. Now, for the reverse. Suppose x is an extreme point, so x is not an extreme interior point which, so this implies that x is in the boundary of C. So, in general, so without loss of generality basically, in general we can write x is equal to so the first k components are non zero with x is an element of C, it is an extreme point. n minus k components. So, it could be that n minus k is 0 that is n is equal to k, but in general you can always write a extreme point in this way. Now, corresponding to these k rows there are columns k columns in the matrix A. So, we are going to show that the first k rows suppose these these are 0 k components x i strictly greater than 0 i equal to 1 to k. So, these are non zero components and these are 0 components. So, the first step is to show that the first k rows a 1 a k, the first k rows of a are linearly independent.
Okay. Again, we will go by the method of contradiction. Suppose not. Then it must be linearly dependent. So, this set of vectors must be linearly dependent. Thus, there exist scalars which are real number because we are in a real field lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda k not all 0 such that lambda 1 a 1 lambda 2 this linear combination is actually 0. Now, construct the vector construct a lambda in R n such that lambda is lambda 1 lambda k 0 2 dots and 0. So, k components n minus k components. Now, I will construct from the given vector x two more vectors x 1 x 2. So, I will take an alpha now as a homework you prove show that we can choose alpha greater than 0 in such a way that x 1 is greater than equal to 0, x 2 is greater than equal to 0. Spend some time with this is a good, good exercise. Now, let us see what is a x 1, x 1 okay, I have got it to be greater than equal to 0 is a x plus alpha a lambda. Okay. Now, this is giving me a x plus alpha times summation lambda j a j j is equal to 1 to m because beyond m sorry this is not k n i am a mistake it is m this m in r m because this com corresponds to m components m columns which are so maximum number of linearly independent columns is m so if k is bigger than m we have to do something. If k is smaller than m, then fine, we already have it. So, if k is bigger than m, I can always reduce that number, I can always bring down and show that if once k is bigger than m, you cannot have linear, they cannot be linearly independent, and that is the whole idea of doing so. Now, this is 0 because first k component is non zero which gives you the linear independent thing the other part is zero so this is nothing but because other lambda is a zero so this is b similarly ax2 is b so which you prove yourself now once i know this fact observe that i can write x observe write x as half x 1 plus half x 2 where x 1 is not equal to x 2. So, if a 1, a 2, a k are, so if a 1, a 2, a k are linearly independent, linearly dependent that is what, then 
x is not an extreme point. So, what I want to show is that if my a 1 into a k are now linearly independent, I should know that because I have full a has full rank m, I still have and if k is and of course k has to be strictly less than m, if k is not equal to m, if k is strictly less than m, then I can choose m minus k vectors from the remaining n minus k vectors and just join them up with this k a 1 a 2 a k and form a linearly independent set of columns. Now, as rank of a do not mind I can write rank as full or big letter or small letter is m from the set of remaining n minus k column vectors column vectors we can choose m minus k column vectors which can be clubbed up clubbed with a 1 a 2 a k to form a linearly independent set because there are there are a min linearly independent columns. Let a 1 a sorry a k plus 1 to a m are these vectors for simplicity here or you just have to make a multiplication with the permutation matrix. So, a k 1 plus dot 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 a m are those vectors. Then one can write a is equal to b n with b formed of the first m column m columns is full rank full row and column rank full rank and now because x is in c we have ax equal to b implying b n. So, our x is x 1 x 2 x k So, b inverse b is x 1 x 2 x k assuming that k is strictly less than or equal to m 0 0. So, here I have k comp k rho and here I have m minus k rows. So, since x j greater than equal to 0 when j is equal to 1 to k this implies that b inverse b is greater than equal to 0 and that is exactly what we wanted if x is a extreme point then I can represent a in this form b and n where b has all its rows and all its columns linearly independent and x can be represented as b inverse b. So, anyway n n the remaining part n into x n is anyway 0. So, and that b inverse b has to be greater than equal to 0 and that is our result. Now, that a polyhedral set as an extreme point is something we are not going to prove because that it will take us off what we want to do, but it is not a very very difficult one and we can possibly do that and the whole idea of BFS might come into play there again, but 
the whole idea of the, this proof will come into there again, but that is not a very, very big issue. The proof idea of this extreme point business whether the polyhedral set as an extreme point comes from the idea of proof of the Carrot theodore theorem. So, we will not get into this business, but I will just ask you to think that for a polyhedral set the extreme points are always finite, just think about it why. Today we end uh, our talk with this one, this uh, proof which has taken quite a good amount of time and we want to say that in the next class tomorrow we are going to prove a very, 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 very fundamental result. This is something you have to remember. This is one of the most important results in optimization theory, in convex optimization that if I know that a linear function has a lower bound that which means that the dual problem is feasible. Once you know that the dual problem is feasible, you know that the linear program has a lower bound and once it has a lower bound, there exists a minimizer for this problem. So, there is an extreme point where the solution will be attained, where the minimum would be attained. So, this is exactly what we are going to prove in the next class. Thank you very much and I hope you have followed this proof and you have enjoyed this fascinating fact that every extreme point corresponds to some special type of feasible point of C. And actually the optimal point, if the optima exists, it is in the in one of these basic feasible solutions and that is exactly what we are going to show tomorrow and we will prove this very, very important fact. And since you have already learnt about duality, and you know from weak duality that it is very easy if I have to just construct the dual problem and check its feasibility. And we will tell you how to check feasibility of a system of linear equations very soon. And that can be done by one of the type of math sim simplex methods. And uh, we will tell you that once you uh, know that there is a lower bound, it is immediately clear that there is a minimizer. This is a very, very important fact from the point of view of computation because nowadays there are many standard algorithms which once you give in the input of the primal, they know the inputs of the dual because the dual inputs, dual data is generated out of the primal data, there is no extra data anywhere. So, in optimization beware if you are studying duality, if you see any dual problem which has some data which does not seem to appear in the primal and suddenly come into the dual, then beware of such duals. Any dual problem has to be created out of the data of the primal because that is the only data you have. Any other problem that you want to say is come running side by side with the same problem has to be generated with the data of the original problem and that is something you have to keep in mind. So, thank you, good night and goodbye.